May the registrar please call the case. Good afternoon, Your Honours. This is case number IT0372A, the prosecutor versus Milan Babic. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the appearances, uh, the appellant first? Who is appearing for the appellant? Good afternoon, Your Honours. Peter Michael Mueller as counsel. And Robert Vogelnest as co-counsel, Your Honour. Thank you. And for the prosecution, please. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, for the prosecution, Mark McKeon, together with uh, Xavier Tricol and Christina Carey, uh, and to my far right, our case manager, Susan Grogan. Thank you. Before I begin, I will give an oral order authorizing the taking of photographs and the audiovisual record of all proceedings in this matter. The Appeals Chamber, having considered the request of the Registry, pursuant to Rule 81D, as read with Rule 107 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, hereby orders that the taking of photographs by the designated press photographers and the taking of the audiovisual record during this hearing is authorized as directed by the Chief of Security of the Tribunal Security Service. The Appeals Chamber now moves to the judgment. In accordance with the scheduling order issued on 30th June 2005, today the Appeals Chamber will deliver its judgment on the sentencing appeal in this case. Milan Babich has appealed against sentencing judgment issued by the trial chamber of this tribunal on 29th June 2004. This case concerns events which took place in Croatia, where the appellant participated in a joint criminal enterprise whose purpose was the permanent forcible removal of the majority of the Croats and other non serb population from approximately one-third of the territory of Croatia in order to make it part of a new serb dominated state through the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity and Violations of the Laws or Customs of War. The joint criminal enterprise came into existence from 1st June August 1991 and continued until at least June 1992. The appellant participated in it until 15th February 1992. On 12th January 2004, the appellant and the prosecution filed a plea agreement and a statement of facts in which the appellant agreed to plead guilty to count one of the indictment, that is, persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds as a crime against humanity pursuant to Article 5H of the statute as an aider and abetter of a joint criminal enterprise. Having examined the plea agreement and the statement of facts, the trial chamber expressed doubts regarding the characterization of the appellant's participation in the crimes charged as an aider and a beta. The parties subsequently met and agreed to file a new plea agreement in which the appellant's participation in the crimes charged in the indictment was qualified as co-perpetratorship. The prosecution recommended a sentence of no more than 11 years of imprisonment. On 27th January 2004, the appellant pled guilty to count one of the indictment for his participation in the joint criminal enterprise as a co-perpetrator. The following day, the trial chamber accepted his plea and found the appellant guilty on count one of the indictment. 
On 29th June 2004, the trial chamber sentenced the appellant to 13 years imprisonment. The appellant appealed his sentence on 3rd September 2004, and the appeal hearing took place on the 25th of April 2005. Following the practice of the tribunal, I will not read out the text of the judgment except for the disposition. Instead, I will summarize the issues of this appeal and the findings of the appeals chamber. I emphasize that this summary is not part of the written judgment, which is the only authoritative account of the appeals chamber's rulings and reasons. Copies of the written judgment will be made available to the parties and to the public at the conclusion of this hearing. I will not elaborate on the standard of review on appeal and the relevant provisions on sentencing since I have already addressed that during my opening statement at the appeal hearing. In his notice of appeal, the appellant initially raised 12 grounds of appeal. He subsequently withdrew his 12th ground of appeal. I will briefly address the remaining 11 grounds in turn in accordance with the subject matter and not necessarily in sequence. Under his first ground of appeal, the appellant argues that he was coerced by the trial chamber to enter a plea of guilty as co-perpetrator in the crimes charged in the indictment. He contends that the trial chamber erred in law and in fact and abused its discretion, first in declining to accept the first plea agreement to which he wanted to plead guilty as an aider and a better, and second in refusing to allow him in the alternative to enter what he calls an open plea to the crime of persecution so that the trial chamber would reverse, would reserve its decision as to his state of mind until after receiving the submissions of the parties at the sentencing hearing. Concerning the appellant's first claim, it is clear from the record of the proceedings that he was fully aware that he had a choice to submit the original plea agreement for the consideration of the trial chamber and that the trial chamber did not force the parties to enter a new plea agreement. The parties themselves decided to file another plea agreement to which the appellant pled guilty. When expressing doubts as to the legal qualification of the appellant's responsibility, the trial chamber acted within the confines of Rule 62 bis of the rules to assess the, act the factual basis of the guilty plea. It entered its finding of guilt on 28th January 2004 because it was satisfied that the plea was voluntary, informed, unequivocal, and supported by a factual basis. Regarding the appellant's second claim, the appeals chamber notes that, as correctly pointed out by the prosecution, there is no precedent for such an open plea before this tribunal and it is difficult to see how the trial chamber could have accepted an open plea in light of Rule 62 bis of the rules. The appellant has not shown that, because, of his, because his request to file an open plea was denied, the plea he entered was not voluntary or was invalid. He specifically agreed in the plea agreement to plead guilty to count one and the trial chamber fulfilled its duty of ensuring that the plea agreement was entered into freely and voluntarily. Accordingly, the appellant's first ground of appeal is dismissed. Under the second ground of appeal, the appellant contends that the trial chamber erred in law and in fact by failing to issue a reasoned opinion and points out two alleged errors. First, the appellant argues that Throughout the sentencing judgment, reference is made to claims, statements, assertions, and matters maintained by both the appellant and the prosecution, and that the trial chamber failed to make any finding as to whether it accepted those facts as true. The appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber need not make explicit findings on facts agreed upon by the parties or on undisputed facts. The reference to such facts is by itself indicative that it accepts those facts as true. In the present case, these undisputed facts were referred to in the sentencing judgment and there is no indication therein that the trial chamber disputed their veracity. Second, 
The appellant argues that the sentencing judgment contains no reasoned explanation as to why a sentence of 13 years would do justice.